<clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my channel. This is Pastor Sean, and thanks for tuning in. For this week's episode, we're going to be going back to the psychology section for this week, where I'm going to be doing reading excerpts and doing an exploration of Michel Foucault's or Michael Foucault's book, Discipline and Punish the Birth of the Prison. So, Michael Foucault, uh, it's going to take too long to explain who this man is, so go ahead and look it up on Wikipedia or buy one of his books. He was a psychology, um, I wouldn't necessarily say he was a psychology teacher, uh, but he was a psychologist back in the 60s and 70s. And the first time I found out about him was after an episode one time I watched of Jeopardy, where he had this um, he had this sit down debate with Noam Chomsky. Um, so yeah, that's the first time I figured out about it or found out about him. So what we're going to be doing is going through this book. So I'm going to be going through random parts of this book of Discipline and Punish: The Birth of the Prison. So, this is going to be in the same line as to how I did the video with when I read Pastor Doug Perry's book, Demons, where I read random excerpts for an hour. So, this is going to be an hour-long video on this so you guys can get something uh, out of this about discipline and punish from Michel Foucault. And I will be buying a couple more of his books for future videos on along down the line. So... We're going to be going, jumping all the way to page 104, The Gentle Way in Punishment. So I'm going to be starting here. So the art of punishing then, oh, just really quick. So this might be a little off because this is an English translation from what he wrote, which is uh, the books that he wrote were all in French. So they're, if some of the things uh, that I read sound a little bit off, it's probably because of the translation. So, all right, anyways. The art of punishing, then, must rest on a whole technology of representation. The undertaking can succeed only if it forms part a natural mechanics. Like the gravitation of bodies, a secret force compels us ever towards our well-being. This impulsion is affected only by the obstacles the laws oppose to it. All the diverse actions of man are the effects of the interior tendency. So to find a suitable punishment for a crime is to find the disadvantage whose idea is such that it robs forever the idea of a crime of any attraction. It is an art of conflicting energies, an art of images liked by association, the forging of stable connections that defy time. It is a matter of establishing the representation of pairs, of opposing values, of establishing quantitatives, differences between the opposing forces, of setting up a complex of obstacle signs that may subject the movement of the forces to the power relation. Let the idea, let the idea of torture and execution excuse me, be ever present in the heart of the weak man and dominate the feelings that derives him to crime. Burkaria 119. I'm not sure what, if that's this book or a different book. Uh, really quickly before I continue, I will be taking random breaks because... I cannot chop this up into parts. Usually I record in 10 minute intervals, but I've been having problems with my computer where the sound has stopped working. So I'm recording this on my phone. So I'm going to be taking random intervals to take a sip of water. So, all right. Anyways, these obstacle signs must constitute the new arsenal of penalties, just as the old public executions were organized around a system of rationality marks. But in order to function, they must obey several conditions. Number one, they must be an, an arbitrary as possible. It is true that the society, uh, it is true that is that it is society that defines in terms of its own interests what must be regarded as a crime. It is not therefore natural. But if punishment is to present itself to the mind as soon as one thinks of committing a crime, <clears throat> as immediate a link as possible must be made between the two. A link of resemblance and an or analogy in proximity. The penalty must be made to conform as closely as possible to the natural to the nature of the offense. <coughs> Excuse me. So that fear of punishment diverts the mind from the road along 
with the prospect of the advantageous crime was leading it. Uh, the ideal punishment would be transparent to the crime that it punishes. Thus, for him who contemplates it, it will be infallibly the sign of the crime that it punishes. And for him who dreams of the crime, <clears throat> excuse me, the idea of the offense will be close enough to arouse the sign of the punishment. So this is the advantage for the stability of the link, an advantage for the calculation of the proportions between crime and punishment, and the quantitative reading of interest. It also has uh, the advantage that by assuming the form of the natural sequence, sequence, punishment does not appear as the arbitrary effect of the human power. In quote, to derive the offense from the punishment is the best means of pro portioning punishment to crime. <clears throat> if, this is, if this is a triumph of justice, it is also the triumph of liberty, for then penalties no longer proceed from the will of the legislator, but from the nat nature of things. One no longer sees man committing violence on man. Marat 33. In analogical, or analogical punishment, the power that punishes is hidden. So the reinforcers proposed a whole penalty of penalties that were natural by institution and which represented in their form the content of the crime. Take Vermeil, for example. Those who abuse public liberty um, will be deprived of their own. <clears throat> Those who abuse the benefits of law and the privileges of public office will be deprived of their civil rights. Speculation and uh, usury will be punished by fines Theft will be punished by confiscation, uh, vainglory, vainglory, by humiliation, murder by death, uh, fire raising by the stake. In the case of the prisoner, the executioner will present him with a goblet, the contents of which will be thrown in his face. Thus, he will be made to feel the horror of the crimes by being offered an image of it. Uh, he will then be thrown in the cauldron of boiling water. So Vermeil 68, 145. <clears throat> Mere daydreaming, perhaps. But the principle of the symbolic communication was clearly formulated by Lee Pelletier. It's a French name I can't pronounce. When in 1791 he presented the new criminal legislation. Exact relations are required between the nature of the offense and the nature of the punishment. So basically eye for an eye. <clears throat> He who has used violence in his crime must be subjected to physical pain. Who He who has been lazy must be sentenced to hard labor. He who has acted despicably will be subjected to infamy. Okay. La Pelletier, uh, 321 to 2. So this is a different book he's quoting. Uh, despite cruelties that are strongly reminiscent of the tortures of the Ancien Regime, a Quite different mechanism is at work in these analogical penalties. Horror is not opposed to horror in a joust of power. It is no longer the symmetry of vengeance, but the transparency of the sign that which it signifies. <clears throat> excuse me. What is required to, is to establish in the theater of punishments a relation that is immediately intelligible to the senses on which a simple calculation may be based. A sort of reasonable aesthetic of punishment. It is not only uh, in the fine arts that one must allow nature faithfully, political institutions, at least those that display wisdom and permanence, are found on nature. So, Beccaria 114, page 114. The punishment must proceed from the crime. The law must appear to be a necessity of things, and... Power must act while concealing itself beneath the gentle force of nature. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Number two. This complex of signs must engage with the mechanics of forces. Reduce the desire that makes the crime attractive. Increase the interest that makes the penalty be feared. Reverse the relation of intensities so that the representation of the penalty and its disadvantages is more lively than that of the crime and its pleasures. <clears throat> there is a whole mechanics, therefore, of interest of its movements on the way that one represents it to oneself and of the liveliness of this representation. <coughs> Excuse me. 
The legislator must be the skillful architect who knows how to employ all the forces that may can be contributed to solidarity of the building and reduce uh, one moment. to reduce all those that might ruin it. So, Bar uh, Beccaria 135. Okay, just need to go. Um, need to go get my drink really quick. One moment. Okay, back to the book. So there are several ways of achieving this. This is page 106. Go straight to the source of evil. Mably 246. Smash the mainspring that animates the representation of the crime. Weaken the interest that brought it to birth. Behind the offenses of the vagabond, there is laziness. That is what one must fight against. One will not succeed by locking beggars up in filthy prisons that are more like cesspools. They will have to be forced to work. The best way of punishing them is to employ them. Um, Brissot 258. Against a bad passion, a good habit against a force, another force, but it must be the force of sensibility and passion, not that of armed power. Must one not deduce all penalties from this principle which is so simple, so appropriate, and already well known. Namely, to choose them in that which is most subduing for the passion that led to the crime committed. Lacetelli, um, Lacetil, 361. So next part. Set the force that drove the criminal to the crime against itself. Divide interest. Use it to make the penalty something to be feared. Let the punishment irritate it and stimulate it more than the crime was able to flatter it. If pride led to the committing of a crime, let it be hurt. Let the punishment disgust it. Excuse me. Shameful punishments are not effective because they are based on the vanity that was the root of the crime. Fanatics glory both in their opposite or opinions and in the tortures that they endure for them. So let us therefore set against fanaticism, the proud obstinacy that sustains it. Reduce it with ridicule and shame if one humiliates the proud vanity of fanatics before a great crowd of spectators, one may expect happy effects for this punishment. It would be quite useless, on the other hand, to impose physical pain on them. So, Beccaria 113. Reanimate the useful Virtuous interest that has been so weakened by the crime. The feeling of respect for property, for wealth, but also for honor, liberty, life. This, the crucial uh, criminal losses when he robs, culminates, abducts, or kills. So he must be taught his feelings once again. And one will begin by teaching it to him for his own benefit. One will show him what it is to lose the freedom to dispose of as one wishes of one's own wealth, honor, time, and body, so that he may respect it in others. Pastorate the first, page 49. So he's quoting like several different people here. The penalty that forms stable and easily legible signs must also recompose the economy of interest and the dynamics of passions. Okay, so third part, number three. Consequently, one must use a temporal modulation. The penalty transforms, modifies, establishes signs, arranges obstacles. What use would it be if it had to be permanent? A penalty that had no end would be contradictory. All the constraints that it imposes on the convict, or yeah, convict on of which having become virtuous once more, he would never be able to take advantage would be a little better than torture, and the effort made to reform it would be so much <clears throat> excuse me, trouble and expense lost by society. If incorrigible there be, one must be determined to eliminate them. But for all the others, punishment can function only if it comes to an end. This analysis was accepted by the, Consti by the Constitute Assembly. <clears throat> the Code in 1791 lays down the death penalty for traitors, and murderers, all other penalties must have an end. The maximum is 20 years. 
Okay. Um, but above all, the role of duration must be integrated into the economy of the penalty. In its very violence, the public execution tended to have the following result. The more serious the crime, the shorter the punishment. Duration certainly intervened in the old system of penalties. Days at the pillory, years of banishment, hours spent dying on the wheel. So, uh, but it was a time of ordeal, not of concerted transformation. Duration must now facilitate the proper action of the punishment. A prolonged succession of painful um, privations, sparing mankind the horror of torture, has much more effect on the guilty party than a passing moment of pain. It, con it constantly renews in the eyes of the people that witness in the memory of the vengeful law and revives in all the moments of the salutary uh, terror time operate of punishment. But the delicate mechanism of the passions must not be constrained in the same way or with the same instance, insistence. When they begin to improve, the punishment should diminish as it produces its effect. It may well be fixed in the sense that it is determined for all in the same way by law, but its internal mechanism must be, vari must, must be variable. In the bill put before the Constituent Assembly, Lee Pelletier, uh, proposed a system of diminishing penalties. A convict condemned to the most serious penalty would be subjected to a, a cat hoot, C A C H O T, manacles on hands and feet, darkness, solitude, bread and water, uh, only during the first stage of his imprisonment. Oh, God. Uh, he would be allowed to work first two, then three days a week. After two-thirds of the sentence has been served, he could pass to the genie, guinea, a cell with light, chain around the wrist, solidarity, work for five hours a day, but with other prisoners on the other two days, this work would be paid and would enable him to improve his daily fare. Lastly, when he approached the end of his sentence, he could pass to the normal prison regime. Uh, he will be allowed every day to meet other prisoners for work in common. If he prefers, he will be able to work alone. He will pay for his food from what he earns from his work. La Pelletier, 329 to 230. Okay. All right. Part number four. For the convict, the penalty is the mechanics of signs, interests, and duration. But the guilty person is only one of the targets of punishment. For punishment is directed above all at others, at all the potentially guilty. So these obstacle signs that are gradually engraved in the representation of the condemned man must therefore circulate rapidly and widely. They must be accepted and redistributed by all. They must shape the discourse that each individual has with others by which crime is forbidden to all by all. The true coin that is substituted in people's minds for the false profits of crime. For this... Everyone must see punishment not only as natural, but in his own interest. Uh, everyone must be able to read in it his own advantage. There must be no more spectacular but useless penalties. There must be no secret penalties either, but punishment must be regarded as a retribution that the guilty man makes to each of his fellow citizens for the crime that has wronged them all. Penalties that are constantly place before citizens' eyes, and which brings out the public utility of common and particular movements. Okay. Uh, I can't pronounce that. Durf, Durfric de Val, Valise, Valise, 346. Excuse me. The ideal that would be for the convict to appear as a sort of retainable, retainable property, a slave at the service of all. Why would society eliminate a life and a body that could appropriate? It would be more useful to make him serve the state in a slavery, slavery that would be more or less extended according to the nature of his crime. France has all too many impractical roads that impede trade. Thieves who also obstruct the free circulation of goods could be put to rebuilding the highways. Well, that makes sense. Far more telling that death would be the example of a man who has ever before one's eyes, 
whom one has deprived of liberty and who is forced to spend the rest of his days repairing the loss that he has caused society. Okay. Uh, Brochure D. Argus, 1781, page 139. Okay, just going to grab my drink really quick. We'll come back to it. Okay, just had to turn the fan on. It's getting kind of hot in here. But, okay, continuing on page 109. So, in the old system, the body of the condemned man became the king's property, on which the sovereign left his mark and brought down the effects of his power. Now, he will be rather the property of society, the object of a collective and useful appropriation. This explains why the reformers almost always proposed public works as one of the best possible penalties. In this, they were supported by the cashiers de dalliances. Let those condemned to penalty short of death be put to the public works of the country for a time proportionate to their crime. Public works meant two things, the collective interest and the punishment of the condemned man and the visible... um, variable character of the punishment. Thus the convict pays twice by the labor he provides and by the signs that he produces. At the heart of society, on the public squares or highways, the convict is a focus of profit and signification. Visibly, he is serving everyone, but at the same time, he lets slip into the minds of all the crime punishment sign a secondary, purely moral, but much more real utility. Part 5. Hence a whole learned economy of publicity in physical torture. The example was based on terror, physical fear, collective horror, images that must be engraved on the memories of the spectators, like the brand on the cheek or shoulder of the condemned man. The example is how, based on the lesson, the discourse... The decipherable sign, the representation of public morality, it is no longer the terrifying restoration of sovereignty that will sustain the ceremony of punishment, but the reactivation of the code, the collective reinforcements of the link between the idea of crime and the idea of punishment. In the penalty, rather than seeing uh, the presence of the sovereign, one will read the laws themselves. The laws associated a particular crime with a particular punishment. As soon as a crime is committed, the punishment will follow at once, enacting the discourse of a law showing that the code, which links ideas, also links realities. The junction immediate in the text must be immediate in acts. Consider those first movements in which the news of some horrible act spreads through our towns and countryside. The citizens are like men who uh, excuse me. Like men who see lightning falling about them. Everyone is moved in indignation and horror. That is movement to punish the crime. Do not let it slip by hasting to prove it and judge it. Ooh, excuse me. Set up scaffolds, stakes, drag out the guilty man to the public squares, summon the people with great cries. You will then hear them applaud the proclamation of your judgments as the proclamation of peace and liberty. You will see them run to these terrible spectacles as to the triumph of the laws. Servin 35.6. Public punishment is the ceremony of immediate recoding. Okay, so he's describing basically what the Middle East is still doing now under the laws of their, their book, the Quran, and from what Muhammad teaches and Allah teaches and the different, and, you know, Jesus Christ and the different prophets. Okay, so even though this is purely, he's talking about purely based in the 1700s. So, okay, continuing. The law is reformed. It takes up its place on the side of the crime that violated it. The criminal, on the other hand, is detached from society. He leaves it. But not in those ambiguous festivals of the A-N-C-I-E-N and seen regime in which the people inevitably took part either in the crime or in the execution but in the ceremony of mourning the society that has rediscovered its laws 
has lost the citizen who violated them. <clears throat> Public punishment must manifest as double affliction. That a citizen should have been capable of ignoring the law, that one should have been obliged to separate oneself from a citizen. Associate the scaffold with the most lugubrious and most moving ceremonies. This is, uh, let this terrible day be a day of mourning for the nation. Let the general sorrow be painted everywhere in the bold letters. Let the magistrate, wearing black, funeral crepe, announce the crime and the sad necessity of a legal vengeance to the people. Let the different scenes of this tragedy strike all the senses. Stir all gentle, honest afflictions. So, do foul 688. The meaning of this mourning must be clear to all. Even, or I'm sorry, each element of its ritual must speak, repeat the crime, recall the law, show the need for punishment, and justify its uh, degree. Posters, place cards, signs, symbols must be distributed so that everyone may learn their significant significations. The publicity of punishment must not have the physical effect of terror. It must open up a book to be read. La, or La Pelletier suggested that once a month, the people should be allowed to visit convicts. In their mournful cells, they will read, written in bold letters above the door, the name of the convict, his crime, and his sentence. La uh, Pelletier, 329.30. And in the simple military style of the imperial ceremonies, Bexen was to imagine some years later a whole uh, tableau or tablet of penal heraldry. Uh, the prisoner condemned to death will be taken to the scaffold in the cart, hung or painted in black, and red. If he is a traitor, he will wear a red coat on which will be inscribed in front of behind the word traitor. If he is a parricide, his head will be covered with a black veil, and on his shirt will be embroidered daggers or whatever instruments of death he used. If he is a prisoner, his red shirt will be decorated with snakes and other venomous animals. Bexen 24.5. This project was represented to the king of Bav Bavaria. Bavaria. Okay, continuing. This legible lesson... His ritual recording must be repeated as often as possible. The punishments must be a school rather than a festival, an ever-open book rather than a ceremony. The duration that makes the punishment effective for the guilty is also useful for the spectators. They must be able to consult at each moment the permanent lexicon of crime and punishment. The secret punishment is a punishment half-wasted. Children should be allowed to come to the places where the penalty is being carried out, there they will attend their classes in civics, and grown men will periodically relearn the laws. Let us conceive of places of punishments as the garden of the laws that families would visit on Sundays. Quote, I propose that from time to time, after preparing people's minds with a reasoned discourse on the uh, preservation of the social order, on the utility of punishments, Men as well as boys should be taken to the mines and to work camps and contemplate the frightful fates of these outlaws. Such pilgrimages would be more useful than the pilgrimages made by the Turks to Mecca. Bristock, quote unquote. And Lee Pelletier considered that this visibility of punishments was one of the fundamental principles of the new penal code. Often at certain special times, the presence of the people must bring down shame upon the heads of the guilty and the presence of the guilty person in the pitiful state to which his crime has reduced him must bring useful instruction to the soul of the people. La Pelletier, 322, uh, quote-unquote. Long before he was regarded as an object of science, the criminal was imagined as a source of instruction. Once one made charitable visits to prisoners, to share their, in their sufferings, the 17th century has invented or revived this practice. Now it was being suggested that children should come and learn the benefits of the law 
laws are applied to crime, a living lesson in the Museum of Order. Okay, I'm going to go get my drink really quick, and then coming back for part six. Okay, and I'm back. <clears throat> okay, so part six on page 112. This will make possible in society an inversion of the traditional discourse of crime. How can one extinguish the dubious glory of the criminal? I don't know, because a lot of people, at least in the years of 2018, and maybe more so from maybe a decade back, of people like worshiping serial killers for some reason. So that one I never really understood. But anyways, so continuing, this was a matter of great concern to the lawmakers of the 18th century. How can one silence the adventures of the great criminals celebrated in the Almat Almanics, broadsheets and popular tales? If the recording of punishment is well done, if the ceremony of mourning takes place as it should, the crime can no longer appear as anything but a misfortune and the criminal as an enemy who must be re-educated into social life. Instead of those songs of praise that turn the criminal into a hero, only those obstacle signs that arrest the desire to commit the crime by the calculated fear, excuse me, calculated fear of punishment will circulate in men's discourse. The positive mechanics will operate to the full in the language of every day, which will constantly reinforce it with new accounts. Discourse will become the vehicle of the law, the constant principle of universal recoding. The poets of the people will at last join those who call themselves the missionaries of eternal reason. They will become moralists. Filled with these terrible images and solitary ideas, each citizen will spread them through his family and there, by long accounts, delivered with much fervor as they are avidly listened to. His children gathered around him will open up their young memories to receive in imperishable lineaments the notion of crime and punishment, the love of law and country, the respect and trust of the magis magistrate straighter Magistrasser, I can't pronounce that, uh, country people too will be witnesses of these examples and will sell them around their huts. The taste of virtue will take root in these coarse souls while the evildoers, dismayed at the public joy, fearful at the sight of so many enemies, may abandon plans whose outcome will be as prompt as it is gloomy. Servin 37, quote unquote. This, then, is how one must imagine a punitive city, at the crossroads in the gardens, at the side of roads being repaired or bridges built, and workshops open to all, in the depths of mines, and may be visited with the hundreds of tiny theaters of punishment.